Hi, can everyone hear me? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about sharing is caring, and in particular, how we can use our browsers to share with other browsers using a technology called WebRTC. RTC stands for real-time communication, and it can be real-time communication of audio, video, and other kinds of files. A few things I want to cover today are uh, a bit of the contrast of what we do in our day-to-day -day work. Um, for me, most of the time, I'm writing code for the client or I'm writing code for a server. So I'm used to writing code that involves sending out requests and getting back responses from a server. Um, some other people might be used to writing code uh, like WebSocket code, which is bi-directional communication between a server and a browser, where a server can actually push information over to a browser. So this is, makes up most of the websites we use. So why do we really need something like WebRTC? Well, the thing is, once upon a time, a long time ago, it used to take a really long time to download files. It would take a really, really long time to download a song. And then so we, uh, people came up with peer-to-peer -peer technologies that allowed people to share files quickly and easily. So if I had part of a song and someone had a part of the same song, we can sort of share those parts, and then that would just result in a faster download. We sort of forgot about that um, when stuff like YouTube came up and our internet connections got faster and servers became way more efficient. But right now, the thing is, out of our internet traffic, 70% of that is now streaming video. So it's going to become an issue when we start having millions and millions of people watching the same episode of Game of Thrones or trying to download the same file. So there are new companies coming out, such as Pair5, which are using WebRTC technologies in order to help people share and download those files faster. Um, it helps people stream video at better quality. If they happen to be in Australia, but the server for that video happens to be in London, technologies like Pair5 will enable that person to watch that video as if it's a seamless experience. Another use of WebRTC is WebTorrent. WebTorrent works with the BitTorrent protocol in order to help you stream uh, video files right into your browser. So instead of you having to use something like Transmission or uTorrent or any sort of BitTorrent client, you can just go to like, a really beautiful web page and watch that file. People kind of worry about BitTorrents. Um, they kind of associate it with privacy. But it's actually possible now, like Interledger is uh, doing demos where you can like, actually have micropayments associated to a BitTorrent download. Um, you can attach metadata to an MP3 or a video file. And people can pay as they're streaming and downloading your file, even though it's peer-to-peer. -peer. So back to the whole WebSockets thing. We, when we do WebSockets, it's almost stuff like push notifications. And it sends little bits of data in order. WebRTC doesn't care about dropping packets. It just sends everything in a big, big stream. So it's a big stream of video. It's a big stream of data for an uh, online game you're playing. If you lose a packet, that's not the important part. The important part is that you get most of the data you need at the right time. So again, back to pair to pair. WebRTC, um, the browser support, is getting better and better. It used to just be for Chrome and Firefox but now it's also for Edge and Safari. Most of the time, it's recommended that you use a shim called Adapter.js to account for slightly different names or naming in the API between browsers. One thing I'm going to spend a lot of time on is how to connect the peers. So the thing with WebRTC is that uh, browsers and computers are very good at sharing data, but they're not very good about caring, um, meaning they're not very good about caring about each other or finding each other. So in order to connect two pairs, we have to talk about a lot of technical terms um, I'm going to touch on really quickly, such as SDP, offers, answers, IP addresses, ports, routers, firewalls, ICE, the Interactive Connectivity Establishment, different kinds of ICE servers, such as STUN, Session Traversal Utilities for NAT, TURN, Traversal Relay using NAT. And then I'm just going to very quickly touch on the data channel, which is available through an RTC pair connection. The data channel is what allows us to share data with each other. So the first part, making a connection. 
um, we take making a connection for granted. Uh, most of us, we have eyes, we have ears. If we see another person on the street, it's very easy for us to connect with another person. We just start talking to them, they can hear us, they start talking back, and we've made a connection. However, for computers, it's not that easy. Computers don't know how to find other computers. Computers are pretty familiar with finding websites. Uh, you just tell a computer to go to a certain domain, and that domain is associated with an IP address and a port. And that way, the computer can find the website. So that kind of thing, your computer is pretty comfortable with. But there's things that the computer doesn't even know about its own self. Your computer doesn't even know its own IP address, which we're going to talk about in a bit. So I lied a bit at the beginning. WebRTC is peer-to-peer, -peer, but you actually need servers to help connect those peers. Those servers don't need to know anything about your peers, and they don't need to store any data that those peers are exchanging with each other. But they need those servers to help make a connection. So an example here, uh, we need to do a lot of this thing called signaling. So at the beginning of the connection, the two peers do a lot of signaling. And then once the signaling is done and they're connected, um, it's almost like the signaling server can fall away. So signaling starts off with this thing called the session description protocol. This is the almost um, the equivalent of like just finding out um, if anyone's out there. So a computer needs to find out if another computer's out there. They make up a session description protocol and send it out. So this is sent out in the form of an offer. The offer goes through the router, through the signaling server, and then reaches the other pair. The pair accepts the remote offer, and then they store it as a remote description. Once they've done that, they create another part, SDP, called an answer. And then that answer is sent out on the network, and it goes through the signaling server, and it goes back to the other pair. So the pair accepts the remote answer and sets it as the remote description. However, at this point, we've sent offer, we've sent an answer, but a connection between the two peers haven't been made yet. So all they know at this point is that someone is sending out an offer, someone's ready to accept that offer, and they want to make a connection, but they still don't know how to make the connection. And they make this connection by doing something we call um, exchanging ICE candidates. So this is a little complicated. Um, I'm going to start at the beginning. So basically, the computer knows that there's someone else out there that they want to connect with but they don't actually know where that other computer is. And in fact, like I mentioned, the computer doesn't even know where they are. Computers connect to other computers by this thing called IP addresses and ports. But because of our routers, we only know our private IP when we're on a home network. To connect with another peer, we need to know our public IP, and we also need to know the peer's public IP. And this whole thing about only knowing your private IP is something called NAT, which is basically a technical term for hiding your address from you. The other thing we have to worry about in order, in, other, uh, in addition to this thing called NAT, is we have to know a tiny bit about firewalls. So the thing with firewalls is that firewalls block ports. And to connect with another peer, we need to know their public IP, and we also need to know their port. So how do we get around these issues with our routers and our firewalls? How do we get around that so that two computers can actually make a connection? We get around these with something called ICE, the Inter Interactive Connectivity Establishment. It's a framework for getting two pairs to connect to each other. And ICE has two kinds of servers. Um, one of them is a stun, stun server, which is session traversal utilities for NAT. And the other kind of server is a turn server, which is traversal using relay NAT. So, a few quick things about these servers. The stun server is often free. There's lots available, and when you're using a stun server, you're only exchanging maybe 10 kilobytes of information at a time, so the cost is next to nothing. People usually give out stun servers for free. Turn servers are used to relay media in case your peer-to-peer -peer connection isn't strong enough, um, and because it's relaying media in large amounts of files, turn servers can be quite expensive. So the thing with these ICE servers is that these ICE servers give you ICE candidates. 
So while that whole offer answer process is going on that I spoke about earlier, at the same time, these pairs are also like making a connection to often a stun server. So the stun server, they get ICE candidates from the stun server. And the main purpose of a stun server is to find out your IP. So the stun server tells the pair what their IP is. And it gets sent back to the pair. Once they have some candidates ready, um, the pairs exchange candidates by the signaling server. And then that's how they reach each other. And once they find enough ICE candidates, um, they have a connection. So it's kind of a complicated process, um, but there is, that's, the, that's the gist of it. You have to send out offers, you have to send out answers, and you have to exchange ICE candidates in order to make a connection. Sometimes stun servers aren't enough to give you a valid ICE candidate. Um, this happens when your router employs a restriction called symmetric NAT. Also, like I said earlier, when you're relaying large amounts of data, uh, you can't rely on stun alone. So this is where the turn servers come in. If anyone's ever used uh, video conferencing in Slack, uh, Slack uses WebRTC, and they rely almost entirely on turn servers. So uh, one thing I want to talk about really quickly is troubleshooting um, before I dive into the code. Um, just kind of like my experiences, like working with WebRTC and issues I've come into contact with. So the first thing I discovered is WebRTC as of the last couple of years, I think, it requires a secure connection. So even though you're just writing maybe client-side code, you have to make sure that you have a certificate, and you have to make sure it's HTTPS, especially for some of the APIs, such as Get User Media, which takes control of a user's camera. Like, if you're controlling someone's camera or their microphone, you want to make sure you're sending out whatever um, video stream you're getting from them in a secure encrypted connection. Because uh, your client-side code is secure, though, whatever you're using for your signaling, and WebRTC doesn't, you can use SIP or you can use WebSockets, um, but whatever you're using for signaling also has to be secure. So depending on how comfortab uh, comfortable you are with setting up a TLS certificate, I think if you're just like messing around, you're just starting, you just want to make something basic in um, WebRTC to feel, find out if you like it or not, uh, I would stick with using Firebase um, for your kind of first kind of messing around. The other thing I found out is, like in my personal experience, I think Firefox is a lot better to do WebRTC development in. Um, the developer, the internal WebRTC tool is a lot more user friendly. It has logs. Um, it tells you if the offer is being sent out and received correctly. Um, I know that Chrome is like kind of pushing WebRTC, and it's probably like ahead in terms of the technology available. But I just find uh, Firefox was a little more friendly to do development in. Another thing I didn't know when I first um, started messing around with making pair connections, like RTC pair connections, is that you can only send signals between two pair connections at a time. If you try to do something like this, it's not going to work. Um, if you're kind of trying to broadcast messages from one pair connection out to two pair connections, you're going to get all sorts of errors. And the problem with these errors is that those errors are misleading. That's not actually what's going wrong with your pair connection. You're not sending out the wrong thing in the wrong state. Uh, it's not that you're missing a turn server or that your turn server is broken. It's actually because you're sending out the wrong message to the wrong pair, and it's getting confused. So you have to be really careful whenever you're architecting or designing your signaling system to kind of keep things like unique IDs and make sure you're sending out the message to the exact pair. The other thing I found, like, in my personal experience is that a lot of the tutorials are pretty misleading. Often you see the remote pair and the local pair. They're often shown in the same script. So you'll see something like this in the Mozilla docs. And you see that the local connection and the remote connection are kind of on the same page. But really, you almost have to have a mental model where you take that code you see in the tutorial and you rip out the remote connection and you keep that in a separate web page which is, as you can imagine, a little confusing here. Like, you'd have to rewrite all your promise code. Another thing I want to briefly talk about, um, I'm just going to show a bit of code now, is that we, I spoke a lot about whole this whole offer, answer, exchange process. 
But I think like if you're just starting out, it's good to have a library that sort of abstracts a lot of stuff like this away from you. So I found um, it was really useful to use this library called Simple Peer. So as you can see, all you do is require the library. You create a new peer. So there always has to be one peer that sends out the offer. So if you have two peers, uh, one peer has to be there to send out the offer. So in this library, you do that by setting the initiator to true. And then you can just listen for um, these f four events. You can listen for the error. So if there's any errors, you can log it to see what's going on. Um, peer on signal, that usually happens when a peer is ready to send out an offer or an answer or send out some ICE candidate information. So in your signal event, you just use your, your Firebase and you send out the messages you need to the correct pair. Um, on connect, uh, once you're connected, all you have to do if you use a simple peer library, if you want to use a data channel, is just send stuff using the send method. So, and you can also handle incoming data. Um, here's some example Firebase stuff. Um, it's, if anyone's worked with Firebase before, I think the first three lines or first four lines are pretty like familiar. Um, you import Firebase um, in the config. It's just you cut and paste what you get from the Firebase website when you set up a new Firebase database. Um, you initialize your app with your configuration, and then you get a reference to your database. And then when you want to send the message, you just, uh, you just push that message to the database. And if you do it with a unique ID, the other peer knows, like, hey, this message is from me based on the ID, and I'll accept that message, and I'll use that when I'm signaling and trying to find another peer. So I have a simple file upload example here. I'm just going to kind of play an animation of it. So this is a destination page. It's connected to one user. And then the data channel is sending cat pictures over. And that's what it does. It's just, it's hard to see how this is different from like a regular file upload. But really what's happening here is that instead of you uploading an image to like an S3 bucket and then displaying it on a web page, this image is going directly from your browser to another person's browser. So in summary, WebRTC allows computers to share media directly with other computers without an intermediary server. However, to connect two pairs, you need to use some kind of signaling server, and ICE servers are required. Um, just want to show one thing really quick. You might possibly need some. OK. Here, yeah, OK. So I'm just going to make this bigger. Um, this is one thing I really like. It's a little hard to see, but if you, if you go into Firefox and you type in about colon WebRTC, um, this pulls up your internal WebRTC tools. And if you go to web, here, I'm just going to go to web. Wait, um, can I get some technical help just for a second? Just uh, when I'm like, I don't know if it's, I don't know what that is. It's hmm. Maybe I'll try. I'm just going to try this. Oh. Okay. So. Hmm. Sorry, just give me a minute. Oh, is it connected to a keyboard or something? <laughs> no? Okay. Just, okay. So, um, okay. I was going to show a website to show how it worked with the internal WebRTC tools, but uh, I think we're having a little bit of technical difficulty. So, that's it for my talk. Hopefully, it's a good intro to WebRTC and some cool tools you can use to get up and running with it. <laughs>